The readings for this and the next two weeks are taken from the third block of teaching in Matthew's Gospel, which consists of a set of parables com communicating aspects of the Kingdom of God. Parables consist of short narratives to illustrate a point. Sometimes the elements in the narrative expl are explicitly identified as pictures of or metaphors for something that helps us understand the meaning. Sometimes the meanings are explained, while at other times they are not spelt out. For example, several of these parables concern seeds, but the picture language or metaphor of a seed is used in varying ways in the different parables. For this reason, it is important to take each parable as a whole to determine its meaning, rather than focusing on single words or taking the metaphors too far. I'd like to start with a monologue written by a lady called Marjorie Dobson. If you're from Christchurch in Woodley, you may recognise her style as I've used her work before instead of readings. This particular monologue is Peter defending the disciples. It's all very well for you to laugh at us disciples, but would you have been any better at understanding if you were hearing one of the tales he told for the first time? I know you think we were a bit thick in the head, having to ask him to explain the meaning of the story to us, but we didn't have your hindsight. That story was only minutes old, not aged by 2,000 years of inter interpretation. We didn't get the chance to get bored with it or to say, oh no, not that one again. And none of us were farmers either, not proper ones. We may have thought we all knew about farming, seeing it around us every day, but we had our own work to do. It took a lot of time and effort to keep body and soul together, I can tell you. So when Jesus first told us that story about a farmer and sowing the seed, we couldn't really see what it was supposed to mean. He was meant to be teaching us about God and showing us how to help people. What use was a story about a farmer who couldn't even plant all his seed into the right place to grow. We talked about it amongst ourselves, but none of us could really work it out. And if we couldn't, what chance was there for any of those rough, ordinary folk following us around? What clue would they have about it? So we asked him to explain. We disguised our question, of course. We asked him, why he had to tell stories instead of just speaking the truth straight out. James and John reckoned that uh, Jesus was trying to keep a grin off his face when he got round to telling us. He certainly seemed to let out a sigh before he started, started out on his explanation. But he was gentle with us in the end, explaining that we were being given a special privilege by being told the meaning. Other people would just have to search around and find out for themselves. Then Jesus took us through the whole story, step by step, until he was convinced that we understood. And he was right about telling stories. You know yourselves that you're far more likely to remember a story than a sermon even if one is as meaningful as the other. Look how long the story of the sower has lasted so far, and how many times you've heard more detailed explanations of it. So those are the potential thoughts of Peter, defending their, the disciples' actions in asking for clarification. And although this parable is explained by Jesus, there is a tension between hearing a parable and fully understanding it. The parables in general seem designed to carry ambiguity or mystery. They invite us to keep thinking 
about what they might mean, both for Jesus' audience and for us in the 2020s. It is not all completely explained. We need to think about what the forms are in our contemporary world and what forms of persecution might draw someone away from God. We may want everything explained, but that is not how the parables work. The first half of this week's reading presents the picture. It's familiar to Jesus' audience of someone sowing seed, probably throwing it across each side of the ground as they walked along a path. The beaten earth grew a field. Jesus notes reasons within the story why the seed falling in each of four different places might be more or less productive. He then calls on the crowds to listen. The second half of the reading jumps a few verses to where, having answered the disciples' questions about why he uses parables, Jesus calls them to hear. He calls them to hear the parable. And it's the same root word that translated to listen in verse 9. And he proceeds to explain it. And this is where our tiny categories of meaning fail us. It is meaningless to argue whether the germinating seed or the soil type represent the person. The wording is ambiguous. But the meaning is clear. The different growing situations are metaphors for different responses to the word of the kingdom. As such, they help explain why Jesus' message is not received with acclaim by all of Israel. Various factors affected how the same seed of God, the same seed of God's words, fared in different circumstances in Jesus' time. Distractions by forces against God, by hostility from others, by worries of life and concern for wealth. Beyond that, we may find that the parable helps us understand why people outside the church today respond in varying ways to the gospel. And it may also reflect how Christians feel that they respond to the ongoing call of God on their lives. This range of potential applicability reflects the power of a good parable. It can speak to various situations in differing ways, but all may be fruitful. In the New Testament reading, Paul contrasts two ways of being or living, and having one's mind set or thoughts centred by the flesh or by the spirit. The former leads to death and the latter to life and peace. With regard to believers, they are in the spirit and the spirit is in them. For Paul, having the Spirit within, her, within is the same as being in Christ. And since the Spirit is the Spirit of God, it's the Spirit of the God who raised Christ, we have life through that same Spirit. And then we turn to the passage from Isaiah. It uses picture language of rain and snow, water in the earth, and producing growth as an illustration of God's word or always achieving whatever God intends. It continues with another picture, this time of creation itself bursting into praise. Here, as elsewhere in the scriptures, there are reminders that all created entities may be understood as responding to God in some way. Although these passages are poetic pictures, 
In our environmentally stressed world, they resource reflection on the relationships between God and a non-human creation. And by implication, between believers' responsibilities towards God's world. We use pictures to communicate ideas all the time. Isaiah and the psalmists both make poetic use of pictures to speak of abstract concepts, such as God's word, or to express the way in which they saw the whole of creation giving praise to God. Paul uses metaphors of walking and dwelling to speak of the ways in which believers' lives are bound up with the Spirit of God. Jesus, the master storyteller, conjures up pictures to communicate deep truths about people and about the work of God. Now let's look at that gospel reading again. Gaze on this field. It's easy to imagine, for Jesus has painted such a detailed picture. You may pass through such fields when you walk the dog. Together, you stroll along the path where, where in spring a few brave seeds have had the temerity to root, but the stones of the path and the tread of Wellington boots soon batter them down. Gaze on the field in July. The sun comes out from behind a cloud. There is a light breeze, and there before you stretch acres of summer wheat, glowing gold and bending with grace and gratitude. Your dog chases away and is hidden by the height of the wheat, heavy with its crop. Around the field is a tough, British hedge of hawthorn, holly and beech, and all intertwined, smothered by brambles. Come autumn, you'll pick the succulent blackberries, but the farmer's seed has no chance here. Consider why this is the first of Jesus' parables reported in Matthew. It is accessible and straightforward easy to understand, and paints a picture anyone can envisage. Some of his latter parables are more complex, but for now, Jesus is willing to be gentle with his listeners. Up till this moment in Matthew, Jesus has taught and healed, and only now does he turn to the many things in parables. Perhaps that is why he is willing to elaborate and take the trouble to explain. Whereas usually we must make the effort to understand. Indeed, his first retort was, he who has ears, let him hear. But he softens and bends over backwards to help the disciples. Not that this parable needs much explanation. How easily we recognise ourselves as the one who lets worries or wealth choke them or who give up at the first obstacle. As it, once, as it was once said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been tried and found difficult. But consider the crumb of comfort in the last verse. Jesus knows we all have different strengths and weaknesses different experiences and hardships that lessen our power. So if one person seems to yield a hundred times in Christ's service, but another only thirty, if that thirty is all he or she has, it is enough. Jesus does not force harsh comparisons between his disciples. Contemplate which seed represents you at present. More importantly, what can you do to change from being the seed on the path or the one caught in the hedge? Pledge yourself today to one change in your prayer or social life. 
one change which will give the seed a greater chance of flourishing. The final part of the parable describes three different yields resulting from seed planted in good soil. 100 fold, 60 fold, 30 fold. What would it look like in our church to experience this level of growth? What would it look like in our churches across our circuit to experience this level of growth? In my church, we've been in decline. Slowly, but we're definitely in decline here at Christchurch. Yet during this pandemic, we have changed a lot of what happens at our church. We have been forced to change and to adapt. Our Sunday congregation is hard to judge in numbers, as we have about 30 to 40 on Zoom, maybe 45 sometimes, which leaves, I guess, about 20 to 30 unaccounted for. I know some are taking their worship with old friends, like Andrew Emerson and his new home in Frodsham, and their YouTube stream. Others are reading the service that we produce, and others are taking services via the TV and radio. We've had some join us on Facebook via the live streams of our services, and some follow our services on YouTube. At least one visitor is joining us live from Singapore. Had it not been for being forced to make changes, these new avenues would not be out there connecting with people. But looking closer to home, I, and I know others, have really enjoyed connecting with our community via the plant swap table that we've got here at Christchurch and the food bank and CCA collection point that we've been running via our car park. It has been nice to see people stop on their way to the shops or on their way back. It has been good to connect with them, to chat and be able to share our God's love with them. The question is, are we equipped to help nurture the seeds that are sown? Can we be the tool God uses? Back to the parable. 100 fold, 60 fold, 30 fold. What would it be like in our churches to experience this level of growth. What would have to change? How would we have to adapt? Are we actually hungry for growth such as this? Or have we become comfortable with the yields we currently experience? It seems to me that we've been offered opportunities within this strange time that we find ourselves in. But are we willing and able to adapt, to hunt down those opportunities. And if we can, are we equipped to share and help others to understand the Word of God? That's my challenge to all of us. Are we equipped? If we're not, how can we equip ourselves to help others? How can we take advantage of these strange times we find ourselves?